There you go. So with that slight delay with Facebook and Zoom, and here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, beautiful people. Here is, I need to change the view because that will be nicer for you guys to watch. And here we go. Got you. I've got you, Rachel. <laughs> here you go. So, <laughs> sorry for all this delay here in the morning. Um, I am super excited to do yet another up spiral grief interview because it's been a couple of weeks through my surgery and post surgery that we didn't have any interviews. And I've got a very exciting guest for the first one back today. And the beautiful Rachel and I, I will introduce you in a minute, have actually connected because she reached out to me after seeing my beautiful Instagram um, account. And I'm really, really stoked about that because I'm, I've been working on Instagram to make this look really nicely and revamp it. And the first guest that came in through Instagram ever is Rachel Engstrom. Do I pronounce your surname correctly? I hope so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rachel, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, with a couple of words and then we'll get further into the story because Rachel's got a really really beautiful heartwarming story to tell and I can't wait to chat with her um, with you guys in the chat so please take it away tell us who you yeah. are and why you yeah here. so I am Rachel I am 39 I live in the Minneapolis St. Paul area in Minnesota so very far away from Marie. Um, <laughs> I really hope someday I can make it to Australia. Um, I moved to Minnesota, not knowing one person when I was 18 to go to the university of Minnesota. I'm from Michigan and I studied anthropology, cultural anthropology, learning about different people, things like that. And when I was 19, my second year in college, I met this older guy. He was almost seven years older than me. I'm the youngest of four. Um, there's a 14 year age gap between myself and my older, the oldest, my brother and my, it was pretty cool. Cause my parents couldn't say anything because they got married when my mom was 19 and my dad was 26. <laughs> so they couldn't say anything about their Perfect. baby. and this older guy. <laughs> yeah. So we got married after I graduated, um, in 2004 when I was 22 and we had a really awesome relationship, great marriage. Um, he worked nights, which was a blessing in disguise because I got to figure out who I was in my twenties, friends, work, all that kind of stuff while still having this yeah. core relationship with him. Yeah. And then when Perfect. I was, <laughs> yeah, when I was 20, um, eight, my own health kind of started to fall apart a little bit. I found out mm -hmm. via having lots of cyst rupture and whatnot that I had endometriosis, mm -hmm. And at that point we had the house, the dog, you know, we were thinking about planning a family and then you throw mm. into the mix. I learned I might not be able to have kids. Mm. So I was kind of really worried about that. Um, and then I thought, you know, it's, it's 2011 the next year, it's going to be great. Things are going to be amazing. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're young. Of course, everything's going to be perfect. And he got a fortune cookie. We had Chinese food on New Year's Eve, 2010. And he got a fortune cookie that said, you're about to have a major life change. 15 days later, he's diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And uh, long, long story short, he got a lot better. Um, he had really intensive chemotherapy. Our parent, my parents came and lived with us. They'd been married um, 45 years at the time. They were 65 and 72. Now it's um, 55 years. They're 75 and 82. And my as we know, this is a grief show. So my husband, he's been gone for eight years and it's this amazing, mm. beautiful relationship I have with my parents that, you know, when the mm. anniversaries come up and the things come up, we can kind of reminisce a little bit about yeah. it and have humor of different things. Um, so mm. that was a lot of, a lot of grace because when you're 28 and your parents take shifts living with you, you think, oh my God, I don't want my dad to fold my underwear. I don't want my mom and my, <laughs> in yeah. my world and my business, whatnot. But you need support. So it was it, yeah. uh, through, through this ugly process of Can I'm sorry, I need to pause you there because I really want to highlight this. I need support. You know, this is, this is such an important thing yeah. in here. And in particular in this group here, I want to just highlight that one sentence, you know, I need support and you reached out. And that in itself is so courageous and so beautiful that you did that at such a young age. 
where you're still actually at the tail end of this, I can do it all and I need to prove my parents and I'm good with this. I don't need anybody to help me for this beautiful life. But I also, before we go any further with this, yeah. I also want to ask you, Rachel, how was your own health through all of that? Because you've just been diagnosed with all of that and you were just dealing with all of that, you know, um, and then your husband got diagnosed. And of course, I can only imagine all of a sudden the whole focus shifted on this leukemia and, and making sure that he survived. Um, because, you know, obviously the survival uh, the threat is basically a lot bigger when you have leukemia than with what you were dealing with. However, that's quite serious too. So how did you deal with all of that during, you know, and obviously you said, it, you know, we needed support and I think it's great that your parents moved in. And um, so how did that all go? Take us back yeah, to it was really for a minute. It was really tricky. I was, no, I appreciate you cutting in and asking that. Um, so I was on like a local GLBT aging board. I kind of throw that out the window. Um, that mm. was something I really liked. I nannied, I worked in mental health. I've worked in mental health the last 14 years, but I worked in assisted living, taking very mentally ill people to like activities, you know, mm. sporting events and concerts and different things like that. So I kept that going. Yeah. Um, but I also had a, a nanny gig on the weekends taking care of a one and a half year old and a three-year-old and I had mm. to say I'm sorry I can't do that so when this happens yeah. it's basically just work sleep eat and spend time at the hospital or clinic yeah um my health I did I did pretty well um honestly I took they prescribed me like birth control and I skipped a week so my body tricked myself into thinking I was pregnant so for a while I was doing really well, but then I would have these bouts where I had so much pain, I could barely walk, yeah. but it's still at the same time, you just pop your pain pill and you keep mm. going. Cause what else mm. are you going to do when your person is yeah. sick like this? You don't yeah. have the luxury to believe anything, but everything's going to go back to the normal program at the end of the half an hour mm. of the TV show. Um, so it was, it was tricky, but it, I was able to somehow compartmentalize I'm not where he is. So my problem's not that as big a deal. Just deal with it, mm -hmm. deal with it. Don't really talk about it. He was going through a war of his own. So I knew I needed to have a support person, whether it was a friend or family member. When yeah. I had to leave him, he was in a clinical trial for children with, um, he's the cutoff at, at, uh, 35. This clinical trial was 18 to 35. So they wanted to try this protocol they use for children with leukemia. So yeah. he had like the first five weeks in the hospital, then he was going to have to go five times a week for five weeks, then three times a week, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason my parents came is because I couldn't have done all that and worked, Yeah. but running yeah. back and forth to the hospital, the first month plus when it was just me and my parents weren't here, I had to have someone that I could talk to because you can't put your crap for better word yeah. on him because he's course. going through his own thing. Yeah. So it's interesting difficult. whether it's yeah whether it's illness or grief yeah. or, or whatever it seems we have these times in our life where people just inherently know marie's gonna call me three times mm. a week and we're just gonna let it all be about her we're not gonna talk about my life right now we're gonna get her 15 yeah. 20 minutes she's gonna do her thing then she'll call me when she needs me and that was cool because i had people in my life that were like okay rachel's gonna talk about what she needs yeah. to talk about and that's what i would do yeah so he ended up um, getting much, much better. And then on our, in 2012, we had to re-hospitalize him on our eighth wedding anniversary. His cancer came back. He was gonna need a bone marrow transplant. So he had months of being in the hospital to try to knock out all the cancer. Um, they basically need to have your body like a, when you have stem cells, he had stem cells from umbilical cords from babies. Um, that were a match when you have that, they need your body because you're taking on a new kind of blood type. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Yeah. I wasn't, it's very cool. So like, yeah, you're taking on someone else's blood type. So you could have straight blonde hair and you end up having dark curly hair or someone in a support group hated Mexican food. And then they have the transplant and they loved it. So you're, yeah. it's awful, wow. but you're learning kind of these cool things. It's incredible. Yeah. So the, he had so much chemo and so much radiation beforehand, before his transplant in January, and he's getting that done. And then I'm in another hospital across the cities 
having another surgery for endometriosis. So then when he has mm-hmm. his transplant, we're both there on our mutual painkillers, just like, how is this our life? <laughs> but it was what it was but unfortunately the so the transplant took but unfortunately the side effects of everything to prepare his body kind of ripped up his his bladder his kidneys his lungs and he was in the ICU twice and then ultimately I got a phone call on Wednesday April 17th and it was him and he said he'd been on low flow oxygen he said it was so um he had so much trouble breathing. They were going to have to put him on the ventilator again. And I got, luckily we said, I love you back and forth a couple of times. And then I got there and he was innovated and he was on life support and they said, okay, well, you know, things don't, they said, I'm sorry. And then they said, we'll wait two more days. And I thought, well, hell in two more days, it's my 31st birthday, but all right. <clears throat> and then on the April 19th, on my birthday, on Friday, they said, we'll wait two more days. And I was watching him fall apart and I knew there was no coming back from it. I believe it was the grace of God, but I was like eerily just like calm, accepting it, going through the motions, Mm -hmm. not really crying a lot because it was like incredible. What I later found out from young widow groups I was trying to find support with is a lot of people have someone come back from war. They take their lives from a PTSD or freak accidents or Mm. they die during war I saw his body fall apart and later that would bring me so much comfort to know I'm watching why what's happening is happening so I made him a heaven playlist on Saturday night and then on Sunday we had our pastor come and Mm. family said bye and then I snuggled up with them and they took him off life support and then he took I played the heaven playlist of our songs that we liked and songs he liked and it took about an hour and his heart stopped And then I walked out of the door and it was, I'm a widow. What now? So then I just had to reboot my life. Yeah. That moment, I I can only imagine, you know, that walking out, I believe must be one of the hardest things that walking away, knowing there is no coming back, you know, it's, it's done. It's busted. And that to me, I've talked to a lot of people, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, because I always feel there's such a blessing in people sharing these moments with me. But there's also always such heaviness in those moments that knowing, and there's another white feather, I love when I talk about these moments, there's always a white feather floating down and I just saw another one. I'm looking at the glass door of my office. And these moments of, you know, in particular, stillborn babies or things like that, when you walk away and you know that you're leaving the body of that beloved person behind and can't take him or her with you, This is absolutely incredible. How, if you don't mind me asking this, how did you get through this and who was there to support you? Yeah, so his physician's assistant, like one of his doctors actually said, when I climbed into bed with him, she said, let me have your phone. I want to take a picture. And I thought, what? And she was like, trust me, you're going to want it. And I looked at that picture of him all bloated and purple and white. And I, I would see okay makes sense um when he had all this radiation and whatnot he had had this like mesh almost hockey looking mask that they Mm. when they put his body he had this he was like number 63 or something in the world to get the space age radiation and this trial thing Mm. so they actually had to like screw down this thing so he wouldn't move when they did it and he was going to take it home so like i stopped on that thing when I knew he was going to die that day. And after he died, I, no pun intended, but I picked up his head and it was dead weight. And then Mm -hmm. it was incredible because I watched his veins just, it was like, it was almost like Spider-Man. So I watched, you know, he's gone that, that happening. And I had so much pride because He had done extra bone marrow biopsies and spinal taps and things just for research. And he was donating his body to the University of Minnesota. So I knew people were going to study. They were going to, you know, he had given so much gift even after Mm. he's gone. So I I stopped playing the music. I climbed out of bed. I covered him up. And then I uncovered him, played Joy Division, Love Will Tear Us Apart, which is one of his favorite songs. I did a little dance for 15 seconds and I said, you wanted to beat cancer and you did. 
I have goosebumps from saying that because he did beat yeah. cancer. It's the side effects that killed him. Yeah. I covered him back up and I left. So I felt like I even gave him a little like send off of sorts yeah. in the, then I went down to the hall it. and yeah, I went down to the hall and my parent, we're big new order fans and pet shop boys and all that. So we went, I went down to the hall where my parents were and my parents just like hugged me and collapsed crying. And I'm sitting mm. there just like in this shock. One of the weirdest things is it's, and it's snowing and it's April is my mom and I are waiting for my dad to come get the car for him to pick us up. And I, I'm standing there having that feeling of, I want to run upstairs, but I know he's not there, but I want to run upstairs, but I know yeah. he's not there. And kind of coming to terms with the fact of, I'm never going to need to come back here. And what's really interesting is directly across the street, because it's at the University of Minnesota, is the dorm where he picked me up for our first date, 11 and a half oh. years to the date. So I've come oh literally my. full circle. And just realizing like, what was so hard when you go through a catastrophic illness like this, what was really weird the next few days and weeks is that entire ecosystem of the nurses, you know, mm. even the person who took my check card at the cafeteria, all yeah. those people you've had relationships with, they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, I was a hamster that was still going on the wheel, but the wheel had been taken away. So it yeah. took me a, f a couple weeks to realize I don't have to know his blood levels. I don't have to do this. Yeah. I don't have to do that. Um, one of my sisters flew in, she helped me. Um, she got like those little name tags you might put in the back of like a toddler or kindergartner at school. So they yeah. don't lose their whatever with their name on it. So we had Grayson, which was his name on tags. I went through his CD, some of his clothes, things like that. So I bundled them up in gifts with ribbons to give to mm. best friends and things like that yeah. at the service. So I'm Beautiful. doing, I'm trying to do these little things. And I didn't know until later, like, so a lot of people sometimes keep, keep everything or clothes or whatever mm. for years, but it was, it was very cathartic to do that, to give yeah. things I had interesting things happen. His best friend since childhood that I was also close friends with, he and I are sitting in the basement of our house, going through stacks of CDs to do this. And we have the radio on and I, I start to tell him, you know, what song drives me crazy that whenever it would come on the radio, no matter what he would have to hear it. It was Katrina and the waves walking on sunshine. I'm walking on sunshine. Yeah, I'm like, and like, the, <laughs> We have a very sarcastic radio station here called Jack FM. And it's this pre-recorded voice. And it's like, and next on Jack FM. And then the song came on the radio and I was like, <laughs> no way. <laughs> right. I was I we, like leaned across the stack of CDs and we hugged, but I had a few things like that happen. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of going through the motions. It's very weird. Cause I'm walking down the right down the block is our church. And I'm having to plan this memorial service, which is just bizarre. Cause I'm sitting in the pastor's office, like yeah. on this little couch where you think maybe Gladys and Oliver have sat when their spouses have died. And I'm like, I'm a mm. W I D O W. Like it just hits yeah. like, this is weird. This is bizarre. And then I have yeah. the whole service and it's weird because you're walking down the aisle and everybody's staring at you and you're like, why? Oh, yeah. Um, but I had this great celebration of life. I played, had a slideshow, played new order, played the pet shop boys. Bruce Springsteen is my boyfriend. I love him. I wanted to play Jesus is an only son at my funeral. So I played it at his, um, I played George Michael freedom 90 when we walked out where it's love like it. freedom because yeah. he's not yeah. sick anymore. Yeah. Um, I had everybody wear bright colored clothes. So I feel like I Beautiful. gave him an amazing send off. Yeah. And then I feel like for the next weeks, I just, so I was blessed enough to not have to work. I had a life insurance policy on him. So I, mm. I took nine months off of work, but I just slept. I slept and mm. slept and slept and not necessarily, I had a lot of insomnia, yeah. so I'd sleep during the day, but yeah. I went to Alaska for 17 days by myself. I was always like, I've seen the Titanic. Tell me what you will. But I never thought that <laughs> I would be a widow at 31 either. Yeah. Um, and being there was incredible and amazing because being around glaciers and mountains and all these things just makes you feel the size of a pea. 
And it's yeah. just like, okay, God, I hear ya. And not everyone in my mm-hmm. life, including my brother and his wife understood why I was using money friends and had from a fundraiser to do this. But my parents were like, you have no idea what she's been through. She's got to leave. Yeah. She's got to go away. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, this is, this is really something that I've shared with a lot of widows. You know, this story about I felt the need to travel. And uh, by the way, um, Stephanie, thank you for watching. She just said, um, I love that song. Check FM is also one of my favorite radio stations. I live south of yeah. Minneapolis about an hour. There you go. Um, and hi, Alex. Thanks, everyone, for watching. I love when people comment and ask questions here. So if you have any questions for Rachel, please do feel free because I do have my phone next to me. That's why I sometimes look down to see the comments. Um, I, I packed up the boys about five months after we've done all the funeral and everything and uh, actually three weeks into it we traveled to find niece came from from vienna it was already booked and she said what i want to do and if you want us to cancel flights i said no now more than ever i want somebody to be there for us and to be with us and do stuff with the boys so i can get some rest and you know and so we went up to Cairns and went snorkeling but then i actually packed up the boys four or five months after and traveled around the world for two months and that was the most amazing thing I could do really just being away from all the what you just said you know it's like that hamster wheel is gone uh, we didn't have that hamster wheel because Rob wasn't sick it just collapsed like that you know but I can so imagine that relief I actually want to ask you a little bit about that because the thing is we don't see a relief per se straight away or sometimes we see it but can't really appreciate it but we've just um, as a collective in the group are going to through the healing journey from grief to relief and in the last session last Wednesday we talked about the hidden gifts in adversity and I love talking about them because they are always there and some see them a lot faster and others take a lot longer to discover them and to accept them as well you know because um, it depends on how we are with the acceptance of our loved ones passing so that will always have an impact on how easy it is or how hard it is for us to accept the hidden gifts and adversity. And a lot of people have talked about it, and I'd love to know how you went with that. That all of that, um, you know, the stress levels, the checking the blood, the worrying, all of that, when that drops off, that can be an absolute hidden gift in the adversity to not have to deal with that anymore although would give everything to continue dealing with it if we still have them no questions asked but you know after the passing after they pass over to go through how is life different now and what gifts have I received throughout the adversity can you elaborate on that a little bit Yeah. So what was interesting is I think what's so taboo about the grief and loss process is people either think you're not grieving long enough or you're not, you're not grieving what I want to say or the opposite. So Mm. I have like the week before I went to Alaska, I got, I just decided on the fly. I was visiting friends in Wisconsin and I got a gigantic peacock feather on the inside of one of my calves and I had serendipity written. Um, and it's just, it's, so my favorite it's word. <laughs> yeah. And I have, you know, years later, I got blessed. I wanted on one to arm ask you what, what yeah. you thought it to because I couldn't see that. There you go. Wow. Blessed and then a year, a year after, um, he, his, he was alive. We celebrated a year. I got strength, faith, courage, but people don't understand that within the ugliness, there can be beauty. One of the beautiful Mm. things is it, it took me some time, but when you start belly laughing, watching TV Mm. shows or things like that, you know, I remember watching the series finale of the office and being like, Oh my gosh, he's not here to watch it with me. Cause we watch it together. And then I'm like, duh, he has unlimited channels in heaven. He's yeah. fine. But, <laughs> he knows the outcome. Don't you dare tell yeah, me. <laughs> but I was just so excited. I'd seen him lose his hair twice. I'd seen him up and down and up and down and up and down. He was just a monster mm. sometimes on steroids. He, mm. um, from the steroids he had in the first course of treatment a year after he was in remission, his hip actually started to collapse and fall out of the socket. He's dragging his leg Mm. behind him and we go see someone and they're like, basically, you know, you're so young and let, and you know, we're not going to fix your hip. 
and they ask, they, they like ask the research nurse, the doctor did like, what's his life expectancy. And it's just, you're thinking like, how, like, what can't you say this? What are you doing? So he had all these co-occurring health issues and all these problems. So after he Mm -hmm. left, you're just thinking, oh my gosh, he's at peace because it's not a way Mm -hmm. to live. It's not a way to be. Um, and it was just really freeing. I don't know when it happened, but it was like a light switch in my mind. It was just so freeing when I chose to focus on what I had had. You have Mm -hmm. a lot, I, you have a lot of like, what a coulda, shoulda, you have a lot of, you know, there were times where it took me a couple of years to let it go, but he would be like, come snuggle with me. And I'd be like, Oh, I'm tired. I don't want to snuggle with you after a full day. We, you know, work when he's tired at home, I had to let that go. You know, I, there were lots of times when he was in the hospital and I wouldn't come spend the night or whatever I did almost every night, but I took breaks for myself. So after he's gone, I'm thinking, should I have done this? Should I have done that? And I think that's a common thing people go through, but I felt mm. so safe and secure and I've done everything that I could. And he loved me and I loved him. And it's, it's time to, this, this is about me now. So six months Mm -hmm. after he died, I had a hysterectomy. Um, So that was kind of another level of loss. That was the first big, huge thing I'd done um, Mm -hmm. without him. My parents came and stayed with me. You know, I had trouble getting out of bed. So my dad's rolling me out of bed you know, he's giving me fish sticks and jello and we're watching spy shows and, (laughs) you know, we're just, we're just, just hanging out. And then a few months later, you know, his cat becomes sick and I have to put the cat down and I'm thinking, sounds really crass, but I'm like, I had to put my husband down. I can put the cat down. It's not a big deal. Um, and over the course of the next couple of years, it was raining Buffalo and dinosaurs, not cats and dogs. So many awful things happened. But when you have something that catastrophic happen, you yeah. think this happened, yeah. I can deal yeah. with this and this and this. Yeah. Yeah. So what was interesting is, <clears throat> you know, I was in this house that I thought that I would fill with children with him. I thought he'd help me pay for. Yeah. And all of a sudden I'm working three part-time jobs, two with uh, disabled children, one with a lady with multiple sclerosis. I'm selling everything on eBay and Amazon and whatever I can, garage sales all the time to try to make money to keep my house. Um, I'm drinking too much. I'm dating too much. I'm mm-hmm. trying to find this other person, which I don't learn until years later Yeah, because I don't have family here. I just want someone to care about my day. I want someone yeah. to, but I didn't realize I was living in a widow fog. And mm-hmm. all these years later, I'm able to say, you know what? That's okay that I did those things because that was Rachel and her widow fog. I did the Mm -hmm. best I could do. Maybe some of my choices weren't the best, but she really kicked butt and she, Mm -hmm. she kept her house and she took that love and she let it bring her forward. And you know, what's, what's really tricky is I had to learn the really hard way. I had this healing blog on Facebook where it was a smaller group of people. And I would write a lot in there. And within there, you know, one day I'd be like, I can't believe it's been three months and I'm feeling okay. And the next month I'm like, the next day I'm like, I can't stop crying. Mm. But in there, I'm asking people, can you come take me for a walk? So someone does. So Mm. I'm realizing more and more and more after people have gone back to their normal lives, I have to seek support or I'm going to sink. So It was I want pretty to talk in- there again yeah. because it's, um, that, that again, you know, that beautiful sentence. I have to seek support, or otherwise I'm going to think. And we all know, some more, some less, consciously, but we all know that we do need support in that time. Yet I believe the trickiest part is to find the right support in the right places and to reach out for it and to allow it in. It's all that you know to find it, to reach out, and to allow it in and that's really really big because it's just something where um people really need to learn to allow that in because it's the trickiest part to ask what comes in what really kicks in straight away is this but what if they are not around then i'm worse off than before because i've showed myself vulnerable and then there's nobody there and that's even worse than not even saying anything at all and it becomes this spiral in your head where 
we need to learn to then go and ask somebody else. And it's okay, you know, to ask until we find the support. I, um, three years later, and as most, as most people know, because I've been doing this, um, I've been running this method for uh, two and a half years now, roughly. And um, I have healed an enormous amount and I've done really incredibly well with my healing journey because I've had all the tools, all the background. I've worked as a mindset coach uh, for almost a decade before. So I knew what I had to do. Yet even I, and it sounds very condescending, I don't mean it like that at all, but even I with all my tools, with all my training, I needed to reach out for support because it's always different if you know, if you've done it before, if you taught other people, if you helped other people or doing it for yourself or allowing it for yourself. I thought for a while I had it all sorted and I don't need anyone, but I did. And when I reached out, it was incredible because I always say, you know, um, when you plant seeds in fruitile soil, they grow so much faster. And that's how I felt every time when I saw my counsellor. She gave me tiny little pieces and snippets and, and seeds. And I was like, woof, you know, and then this beautiful plant came out of it. So this is incredible. So I was so open to it. I was not in a I know it all state. I was in a I need help state. And I think that's the biggest, you know, there are a lot of people out there who know a lot about these things, about mindset, about mental health. But when you are in that situation yourself, things change. It's a different perspective. And to say you do need help and to reach out is really incredibly important. I also want to quickly um, jump over to another question that we had here from our beautiful audience. Um, Stephanie is asking, my friend is a young widow too. She's two years into this journey and just turned 40. How can I best support her? as a friend i do know that you and i had this conversation behind the scenes already but i'm more than happy to also get rachel's opinion on that because my take was the best thing is to be there to be proactive to just stick with them and really offer um like concrete examples of help you know do you want me to take the kids or do you want me to come and play with them do you want the night out or do you want me to uh, be there with you do you want me to cook you dinner on Tuesday or Thursday. I can do chicken or lasagna, you know, like give two very simple options, give um, ideas of how you can support them, things that you actually can do, you know, offer them genuinely so they don't become overbearing for you because you've got your own family. So it's really about finding that balance and offering things that you can do because the other person feels it when you offer it, but then you get into overwhelm and then they close off even more so and don't want any more help. So this was my take on it. But Rachel, if you have a few words to say with that, I'm uh, you know, more than happy to hear your opinion on that as well if you want to share a few things here. More ideas. Yeah. With what you were saying before that, I was thinking like the what's really tricky when you go through something like this is you kind of, I don't want to use like the cliche, like you, you learn who your friends are, but you kind of restructure, like, just but like you when do. you leave a job, yeah. you might not have those same friends. Yeah. It's really important for someone that's going through something that's difficult to have people who are just going to listen, who aren't going to be judgmental. I myself had a friend of, and I think Marie had talked about this. Um, you know, I was going to be maid of honor in her wedding. We've been friends for 12 years. She was friends yeah. with my husband as well. And all of a sudden she became yeah. very toxic, very judgmental. And I had to end that relationship and not mm. everyone understood it, but when you're going through it, you need positive people. You need to surround yeah. yourself with, you know, positive TV shows, movies, music, people. So when you have a friend that's going through something like this, they don't know what they need, let alone they don't know how to ask. So it mm. isn't like what you're exactly what you're saying. Just give a couple of choices. Do you need me to run to the store? When you're mm. going through grief, you're so tired. It's levels of fatigue you never knew that you had. Sometimes yeah. if it's like me and it's been an illness, it's been this forever. Oh, so you're finally kind of landing. Mm. Um, yeah you know, ask them, can you shovel the driveway? Can you cut the grass? Can you do these things? Do you want to play a game? You know, I think a really important thing you can do is set a timer on your phone just a couple times a week to send mm -hmm. them a text because we all get so busy. Yeah. We forget about yeah, things. That's beautiful. I love it. Absolutely. Just letting someone yeah. know you're there and then mm -hmm. giving a couple options because it's better to say, hey, do you want to do a Netflix night? Do you want me to bring over, you know, Chinese food or Thai food? Pick a night mm. next week. 
that yeah. gives them the option. And if they really mm. don't feel like it, they don't feel like it. But if it's been a couple of weeks of them not feeling like it, try to get a little pushier because yeah maybe they want to do a 20 minute walk versus a whole mm. movie night or a dinner night, but try to give yeah. options because they really do need you more than ever. But there's a lot of pride and I mm. can fix it. I can do it on my own and just know that they really can't, they need you. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's definitely that. And I also feel that um, there's sometimes helplessness as well to not know how to accept that or how to allow it or how to ask for it even and it, it's really interesting because you know what I wanted to share before and then I got sidetracked with something else uh, me having been through my healing journey or through the majority of it you know I really feel that I've done the majority of healing in my life and um, we're getting so much love and I really beautiful. I love it when all the love ones are flying um, and then all of a sudden I found myself back in a state of helplessness and I was quite surprised because this is so not me I'm so not a helpless person and I haven't felt helpless for a really long time and I caught myself feeling that and um, you know what what I always suggest is when you can, when you catch yourself with feeling something like that to really observe that and I wanted to honor that I wanted to see it and acknowledge it and the healing part comes always after, you know, there's always that see it, acknowledge it, heal it. That's my, my circle I always talk about. Um, I wasn't in the healing stage. I was in the acknowledging phase of it where I'm like, wow, I'm feeling, I felt loneliness. I felt solitude. And that happened last week only. So I went through a really rough patch last week that came so unexpected because I'm like, wow, me now, what? You know, I've been um, through this whole journey of COVID I, I never felt um, the effect of it as badly as other people did I always felt really blessed because in our small country town here uh, we never had a single case of COVID so I felt safe I felt good we you know hardly had to wear masks and then all of a sudden wham you know seven weeks lockdown uh, like really strict lockdown as in not leaving more than 10 kilometers etc and at first again didn't feel anything and was up to fine because I work from home anyway yeah the boys are homeschooling it's a bit different but even there you stood now because I've done it before so I'm going through this whole yeah I'm fine I'm fine and then my hand surgery came and all of a sudden I was dependent that's the key word here on everyone and everything to drive me to pick me up to you know get me to my physio appointment to uh, go to the store to pick up some milk and, and I had done all the shopping before because I knew I'd need a lot of you know food in a house to not have to do all that so I did that the day before surgery um, but then again you know one and a half weeks you do need milk in between you do need the little pop-ups in between and the click on collect you know that with the home delivery didn't work and it was like oh yeah you can actually next delivery in three days but well, three days I need this tonight for dinner how am I going to yeah. do this so it's just, it was, I mean, I laugh about it now because it was only last week and it was like, oh, you know, <laughs> the frustration and now I laugh about it already. Um, but this is where I felt it for the first time because everything came together. I had to ask for every little thing as in, can you open this bottle for me? Can you unscrew it for me? Can you, because I, like my whole arm um, was in a cast, so I couldn't grab anything apart from those two fingers. And it's like, oh, oh, I can't hold it. You know, I felt really handicapped, like perfect work for it, you know. And um, and then my neighbor said she can take me to the shop, but the shop that she was going to, going to was uh, further down the coast. And I had this feeling her husband's not gonna be happy with that. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, I got the text message, I'm very sorry, but he's not happy with me taking you. And if we get stopped, we could be fine. And I thought, well, we could, we could not. I'm not really sure what it's like with a medical emergency. And if you can't, I wasn't sure about the legislation. And it wasn't about the fact that she said no, because I kind of felt it in my heart already anyway that he would be happy. But it was the fact that I felt I've got no one. I literally fell yeah. into full of solitude because of the lockdown. I couldn't ask for anyone. Nobody was allowed to come to my house. I couldn't just say, you know, can you just drop me? And um, yeah, so it was really, I really felt the effect of it for the first time. And then all of a sudden, um, I'm, I'm feeling super vulnerable sharing this, but because I feel like that, I really want to share it because I can yeah. only imagine how other people would feel extremely vulnerable around this or a very similar topic. And then I fell into this next hole of um, I'm failing my kids as a mom because all they do is this on screen. We're falling apart as a family. We're not connected anymore. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. And I'll, 
you know, and I cried to my best friend on the phone for like 20 minutes and he was just holding space for me like a trooper. He was just listening to me. Um, bless you, Steve. I really love that you were there for me in case you're watching this. It was just incredible. You know, I really felt it. And he said, I know that you're feeling this right now, but you know, it's not true, isn't it? And I just kept sobbing. I said, well, that's exact point. I don't know if it's true. I really felt in that moment, I don't know if it's true. Maybe I am a bad mom. Maybe they shouldn't be on screen that much. But, you know, with lockdown and friends catching up and school and everything's on screen, I felt like I'm in my office there upstairs in their room that we're all on screen. And then I say good morning and good night. And in between, we have one meal together. And I felt horrible. I felt I was failing them as a mom. I felt our family was falling apart. And I really felt the effect of all of that. So there were a couple of days where... I was super emotional. I could hardly stop crying. And I was like, well, that's maybe exaggerated, but I cried a lot, you know, and it was just really incredible. Now, in hindsight, my heart's smiling because I'm thinking I needed to release that. And there was somebody there for me to hold space. And I did talk to my boys about it. And they were like, what? <laughs> like, <my> awesome <laughs> of course, they think I'm awesome because I let them be on screen. But it was this whole thing of putting things back into perspective. And that is why I wanted to quickly share this story here. Putting things back into perspective when you realize, you know what, this is temporary. It's not that our whole family has fallen apart. It's just that we do spend a lot more time on screen right now. And hey, I've got my car stuff. I can drive again. I can go shopping. And all of a sudden, everything was back to normal, you know. And that, to me, I just wanted to share that because I feel with what you've been going through, Rachel, with what I've been going through, with what a lot of you are going through that are watching this right now, asking for support and having the right support network and knowing that you have these friends that you can call and cry to or that you can call and they uh, take you shopping or bring you shopping, whatever that is that you need. It's really important to consciously allow in and seek it actively and reach out to people and say, I would need this. Can you take care of that? And it's incredible how happy it makes people when they can actually help you. Because imagine the helplessness that other people have watching you going through something like that. And then you throw them one little thing, like one little crumb. And they're like, yep, of course I'll take it. I'm so happy if I can help you. I never realized that, how much I was giving to people when I allowed them in and when I allowed them to help me. So with that being said, Rachel, um, I would really love to share something else. I want to go a little bit deeper into this because do you have... Yeah, can I say a couple quick things? Sure, absolutely, please. So I think like I actually went to an amusement park on Saturday. I hadn't been in mm -hmm. like a decade. And my example I like to use is like when you're on the grief roller coaster that mm -hmm. bar is gone down, you're buckled in, the attendant's gone to the person behind you and the bar is not going to come up. And I, mm -hmm. I'm 39 and I love roller coasters, but still when it goes up that hill, I'm like, oh crap, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but that's really what it's like. You have to, yeah. you have to just submit to it. You have to go with it because it's kind of yeah. like having a really bad stomach ache and not, you know, taking medicine for it. And it's not going to go away. Otherwise you just, you have to, yeah. it could be a year. It could be three years for me. It's been eight years. I still have things that pop up every now and then, and I just go mm. with it, but it's one of those mm. things that like you go with it. And then it might be a couple days or like what you said later, you'll be able to reflect on it. And when you were sharing and very vulnerable about how you felt and then you went into am I being a bad mom and da, 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 because I'm a lot farther out I found that almost even a little comical because of course you're not of course you're of course but when you're in those things it's a domino mm. effect of yeah you're so oh, vulnerable you're so, you know, I, I wasn't making fun of you by any means, but you know what no, I mean? I'm able to see it. See I'm able much. to see it farther yeah. out as I was like, of course she went there because when you're there, you're just, yeah. Shh. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it's all about just taking that time, allowing it to happen and then knowing it is going to get better. It's kind of like, mm. um, when you feel really sick and you feel like you're never going to get better and you're like, I know I'm going to, but right now I'm never going to get better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I really like, you know, because of 
the healing journey as well there's one chapter that i'll share about uh the hole in the hill experience where the hole is like going down into the rabbit hole of you don't know if you can come out of that again and the hill is like the little pile of happiness that you've already created and to learn that art of sitting in the middle and observing what's going through your mind when you can feel that but at that part i could feel it happening and i missed the observing part and i slipped right into it but then when i was slipping I did observe myself funny enough and I did realize what was going on and I thought I just have to ride this out now I just have to allow that I have to cry it out and uh, I felt really good afterwards that I did because it was a lot of built up emotions that just needed to come out and things and worries that I had that I hadn't shared with anyone so I felt extremely vulnerable sharing that with my closest friend and now I'm sharing it with everyone because I'm okay with it now. Do you know what I mean? And I felt if mm -hmm. I share it with you, you might realize watching this here right now that you're not alone in this. We all have moments right. like that. And I, I want to highlight that. We all have moments like that despite grief or not grief. That's just life. We have moments of doubt. We have moments of self-doubt. We have moments of I feel really lonely and incredible solitude right now. We all have these moments and it's okay. You know, it's just the matter of I want you to understand that it is okay that everybody feels it and that you can reach out and ask for help. I know how hard it is. It's incredibly hard. I understand that I've been there, I've done that. I was one of those people who thought I need to do it all on my own. And now I'm like, I love that I'm not doing this on my mm -hmm. own. I write a gratitude journal every single morning. And one of the things that I mention very often is my circle of friends. I'm so grateful for them. And, um, I've shared, do you know, Rachel, do you know the book, The Magic by Rhonda Burns? Mm -mm. It's incredible. I'll share it with you later. But uh, for those of you watching, I've, I've done a lot about The Magic. It's a 28-day workbook about gratitude. And one of the things mm. you need to do is that write a list of your tech, top, tech, top, top 10 desires in your life. And one of them for me was having an incredible, supportive, beautiful circle of friends because that's one of the things I really feel is one of the most important things in my life and um and then yesterday was the exercise you need to tick off what you already have and I took that circle of friends off I'm like you know it, it comes up over and over again in my life it's just really incredible and uh everybody watching is you know exactly who you are I love you so dearly and it's important for me to have you in my life and I feel honored to be in yours so Rachel I want to get into something that's really really important for me in our interview here together that we have enough time to talk about this because you have put something together that's incredibly resourceful and it's the number one reason why I invited you to come uh, into this interview not just to share your story but to share what you have, uh, what you actually have created so I'm going to hand this over to you give us a bit of a rundown how did this come about how did you start to create this and what is it I'll let you take that away yeah, so when Grayson first became sick in 20, January 2011, he was in the hospital just a few days and someone told me about Caring Bridge. Um, I'm not sure if it's global, it's national here in the US. It's a website where instead of people texting, calling, emailing, how's the patient, how's the patient, for people on their medical journey, you can do an update blog and then you get emailed for supporters. So yeah. I had all of those posts along with team Grayson on Facebook. And then later in my widow years, the healing blog, the Instagram. Um, so I had all those, I decided in February. So he died in April of 2013. I decided in February of um, 2014, just one day, I remember standing in my bedroom going, that was so hard. This is so hard. I want to help other people mm. not feel so alone because I felt I knew no one that was a cancer spouse at 28. I knew especially no one that was a widower, widower at 33. Um, so I decided to put it together in a book. I started putting the social media um, posts together in chronological order in 2014. And that was just too painful kind of reliving it. But I remember being on an airplane, mm. going to visit a sibling once and asking the guy next to me, if I had, if there was something like this, would you read it? And he's like, oh, I totally would. Mm. So then I decided mm. I started writing it in 2018. I decided do the post intersplice your love story. But when I'm navigating diagnosis, treatment, insurance, disability, work, budget, finances, everything, 
when I'm doing it in mm. real time, I explain how to do all of it. There's nothing like this out there. Yeah. So it's Rachel 1.0 when he's alive and ill. Rachel 2.0 is the second I mm. exit that door after the little dance. I exit the door and it's yeah. wife, widow, now what? That's what my book is called. And I originally mm. wrote it mm. for from a cancer spouse, significant other to cancer spouse, significant others. Um, yeah. One of the things I do now is I'm on tons of podcasts because I want to share the fact that you can have your life explode and be okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I share in there how to navigate birthdays, anniversaries, how to, mm -hmm. how to adapt, how to do these things, how to ask for help, how to suck it up yeah. and be okay. Things were not mm -hmm. always good. I have a chapter called Bitter Betty. I talk about dating, work, all these types of things. And as you see me falling mm. on my face and falling on my face and falling on my face, I still have positivity because I know I was loved. I had love mm. and I lived believing that God had a plan for me. But you know, when you have vacation coming up and you're like, you kind of know what it looks like you have plans and then you're on it and you're like, Ooh, I have five days left. I have four days left. I have three days <laughs> left. I was living with this kind of fog in front of me, but mm. I knew that somehow I would be okay. So I just lived that way. I believed, I believed, I believed. And then in the, I put my house on the market. It, I was like, I'm going to move to Maine. I'm going to live on the seaside. I'm going to revamp my life. That didn't work out because the house one street over, same 1956, everything listed for 30,000 less. So I wouldn't have had enough money yeah. if I sold my house to move. Yeah. So I went to Target. I went to Ikea. I got a big Audrey Hepburn post like print. I just girlized my house after he died. I got <laughs> my Frida Kahlo print. It's like half human half deer that my husband always hated. I put it up. I stenciled my house in pink. I embraced a girl <laughs> lives here. A boy is not here anymore. So yeah. I, I just, I, it was a bitter pill, but it was like, okay, you're not going to move. You're going to start over. I applied mm. for all these jobs and I ended up getting a job at a behavioral health insurance company in the fall of 2015. I met a guy who was 11 years older than me. I can't have kids. He has a four-year-old. Fast forward this fall, we will have been married for five years. Um, so two and a half years after Grayson died, I got married again. And oh then um, how many years after? Two and a half. Yeah. This this to me, this really, is really, really beautiful because I, I I knew that part, you know, from our pre-chat and I was waiting for you to share this because I always love when there are happy endings. And I'm not emphasizing the word ending but you know what I mean when they're happy continuums yeah. I should actually call it rather than anything else and uh you know when you think about where where you've come from how you've worked through this how young you were and still are um going through this whole journey and sharing all of that in a book in a such beautiful resource you know and um Rachel will actually share the links underneath this interview in case anybody's interested having a read this book then um you know it will be available for you like so Rachel can share the link and um, any other links that you want to share for um you know if you have a website or anything uh how people can contact you it will all be in the comments below so watch out for that or feel free to reach out to Rachel she's in the group as well in our group loving love after loss so you know, to hear this, this is so beautiful for me to hear this, that you couldn't have kids, you had to have to hear, hear I can't even pronounce it anymore, hysterectomy, thank you, and um, and then meeting somebody who's got a daughter and having such a beautiful relationship, not just with him, but with her as well now, this really warms my heart, this is, you know, this is spreading hope, yeah. love, I just, yeah, I just, I'm a the, love, so yeah, that's my favourite part. The, <laughs> the really tricky thing is, it's really hard to date when you don't have an ex. You have someone you love. You have someone that loved you. You don't have someone that you're going to say, screw them. So it's very intimidating. I met my husband at 19. So I didn't know people lie. I didn't know all these things that were happening in the dating world. Mm. So it was trial and error, but I kept believing yeah. God's got someone for me. I'm so young. I know I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And I'm with this incredible person who helped me edit my book, who helped me reformat he says he fell in love with me because he heard me talk about the love that I had had. So it's, it's just, I'm insanely blessed. That's beautiful. Absolutely so I beautiful. put this yeah. book with resources of it's a love story toolbox. It's the first of its kind in the entire world. <laughs> so I have this out there to help people, 
But more importantly, even besides just getting the book out there, I wrote it because I felt so alone. I had nothing like this. I've cried before wishing I had something after I've written it and I yeah. would work on it for like six to eight hours and then cry for like 20 minutes because it's just so, I mm. feel so bad for yeah. what this girl went through and it's crazy. It was me, but yeah, the, I did learn that you say that, you know, you felt yeah. so, so horrible for this person. It's crazy that it was you because really what happens is you do like, but, you know, people often say to me, and I read this in so many other grief support groups, um, that people are like, well, my, my life's never, ever going to be the same. Well, of course not. But people often say that, meaning it in a really negative way, in a sort of resigning kind of way, in a giving up kind of way. And to me, I just want to invite everybody watching this, when you, whenever you hear somebody say that sentence or even in particular if it's you saying that sentence my life is not ever going to be the same I invite you to give it a go to see this sentence as a neutral statement because yes you are absolutely right your life will never be the same yet whether that's a positive or, ne or negative thing is absolutely in your power mm -hmm. and I needed to say that because it's your choice what you do with it that makes all the difference and this is why I love talking to you Rachel because that's exactly what you've done you know you're looking at that person now thinking wow that was me you know and you've made some incredible choices some bad as well you said but it's some incredible choices <laughs> to get you to who you are today and you've created this person and this is absolutely beautiful I just love having you here thank you sharing that with us. yeah my older brother told me early on in my husband's illness this is a chance for you to restart. I didn't know later it would be wow. restarting without my husband, but he, the mm -hmm. biggest thing he said is you can choose to be bitter or better. And sometimes I was yeah. bitter, but choosing positivity and trying to, you're going to have really ugly days. I still do mm -hmm. every now and then I had a fundraiser. So one of the things I do is I, I talk to different people, um, different podcasts and things but I'm just really excited to share the fact that you can be okay. You can have something horrible happen and yeah. you can be okay. And oh, I apologize. I forgot what I was going to say, but, um, mm, it was good. It'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, um, <laughs> one thing about my book is it's really gritty. I don't sugarcoat anything. And I think that's what people mm -hmm. need to hear and see too, is like, yeah. I go from a to Z or from A to Z back up to A. And I think that knowing that people are, people are going to say things that are rude, like, oh, I get it. I understand. And you're going to want to go because no, they don't. But the thing is you are going to find level upon level upon level upon level of strength. You never knew that you had. So yeah. I, Marie put this in the notes before the show, but I get people for a living. I get people connected to counseling. And I had a woman call mm -hmm. in this morning and her significant other killed themselves in front of her on Saturday. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I thought this is horrible and she's going to live with it for a really long time. And it will always be horrible, but someday, somehow she's going to be better. And it took me mm -hmm. a really long time and a lot of work to not see the illness, Grayson, to not see the death, Grayson. And more than, more than ever, you know, I see the funny things. I miss, I miss the little funny things that he does. Um, oh, what I was going to say is earlier this year, I raised $51,000 with some friends for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Wow. I got a grant in Grayson's name by doing That's that awesome. to help other forms of blood mm. cancer. And it's amazing mm. how you might be going through something really difficult, really ugly, but it's going to turn into this gold nugget. That's going to be yeah. an amazing thing that will turn your life in a different way to volunteer or job or being able to say, I get it. I am so sorry. I've been there and yeah. you mean it, you mean it. And mm. it's, um, you know, beautiful things can come out of something so ugly. It, it really can. And I would never believe that I'd be where I am today. But a lot of it was just the conscious choice of saying, I'm grieving, I've grieved, and 
I'm going to move forward. And I, if I see a a show on Amazon and it looks great and then I watch the thing and it says it's about cancer or dying, I'm like, nope. You know, it's what we, what we choose to expose ourselves to when it was the final day of the fundraiser in May, in May, the final day of the fundraiser, I became so angry and could not stop crying for an hour. And it's Mm. eight years after he's died. And it was just that I was angry that cancer steals people that that happens. But then I was able to say, you know what? it did steal him and it steals people, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say this happened to me and I'm going to help other people. And I'm consciously choosing what I'm exposing myself to or what I'm not, who's in my life, who's not. And that's incredible is that we have choices and it will completely help you move forward. And just let, just the toughest thing is just let people know that you need help. It may take you a few Mm. tries, but just suck it up and ask for help because you'll be so glad that you did. And the toughest thing is people don't know how to help. They want to take it away. They want to make it better and they can't, but they can be there with you. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that is one of the biggest things, right? So just to be there. And I'll never forget, like one of the most amazing things, Joe, if you're watching this, this is for you. One of my girlfriends reached out to me. And it was the day that we came back. It was five days after Rob passed. And we flew to Perth, to the other side of Australia, to identify his body, to do all the paperwork there. And I was coming home. And I did not expect for that to hit me that much after, you know, what we've just been through, the the flying across the country and, the um, you know, seeing him for the last time there in the the mortuary and, and having done all this with my two eight and ten year old boys coming back home we've got a drain across the driveway there's six houses around us there's a common driveway and the sound of the car driving over the drain that was the sound of coming home and that to me that's when it hit me I had to stop the car at the bottom of the driveway and cry it was just Mm -hmm. that release of I'm coming home for the first time into this empty house. You know, like it obviously it was not empty because the three of us are living in there. <laughs> We've got a lot of life in there. Um, but, you know, that feeling of he's not there and he's not ever going to be there again. And um, and my beautiful friend Joe had rang me and said, do you want me to come and just sit with you? You can cry, you can scream, you can laugh, we can do whatever you want. I'm not going to ask you any questions. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to be there and sit with you. Do you want that? And I said, yes, please. And she came along with her beautiful son, Finn, and Finn and Flynn, my, my eldest Flynn, uh, are friends. And they, um, you know, they went to the, still go to the same class together. And it was so beautiful to have Finn there for my boys and her just sitting with me. And I remember we were sitting in front of the fireplace because it was winter. And we did chat a lot you know but she was just there to hold space for me and that was the most amazing thing that anybody could have done for me there were a lot of other uh, beautiful stories throughout as well but this one really always stood out for me that just I'm just going to be there to sit with you and this is also coming back to Stephanie's question you know this is is the most amazing thing that anyone can do for you when you've just lost someone just come and sit with me and that was just really beautiful really beautiful I don't think that she'll ever understand how much that means to me that she did that for me it was incredible so I can't believe we're already at the end of our hour together I absolutely loved having you Rachel it's really beautiful everything that you shared with us so straight from your heart Um, again please do share your links your book anything that you want to share in the comments underneath the interview so people don't have to go about searching for it and um, I'm going to let you say some final words here if you want to. Yeah, just know that you really aren't alone in it. When you're going through it, you feel like you're just in this little jar, that it's just you, you're yeah. this mosquito or butterfly or whatever you want to say that's trapped in there. Mm. And you really do feel like everyone's staring at you. Everyone is wondering how you're going to act, what you're going to do. And you really just have to embrace you know that you do Mm. have the conscious choice know that everyone is going to have not everyone but a lot of people will have expectations of 
I had people in my mm. life, even my own brother, six months later, he's like, oh, you could decide to, you know, just decide to be happy. And you're like, oh, and what was funny is I told his, his wife Whoa. that how, <laughs> I told his wife of like 25 years, how he was like, oh, you know, I would be, you know, if she died, I'd be okay. And she's like, nice to know that. But it's, it's one of those things where it's, people are going to want to help you and they're going to say inappropriate things, but Mm -hmm. take it with a grain of salt because they are reaching out. They are saying things and know that those people that are there, sometimes you feel bad, like, well, they're doing a lot for me. I'm not doing anything for them. No, Mm -hmm. more than likely you're going to be there for them when something hard happens. Um, yeah. But life really, really does. And always, get it is beautiful for people when they have this feeling of, I can actually do something. You know, that's what you're yeah. giving them. It's a gift for them to be able to do something. I really had to learn that. And I also think, you know, the comment of your brother, um, I am very happy for him if we don't have to find out how true that statement really is. When you think about it before and when it actually happens, it's also very two different, completely different things, you know. But uh, yeah, I just, I just think what you said with the take it with a grain of salt, I think it's really, really important that we understand that helplessness of people as well when they say something that feels very highly inappropriate to you um, or sometimes you have feelings where you just want to <clears throat> slap them. <laughs> like people that. don't know you what know, to say, but human. it's... Exactly. And I was that person before as well. Before my dad passed, I was 20 when my dad passed and I was standing in this condolences line and I thought if somebody else tells me my condolences, I'm going to punch them. I literally felt like that. And of course I didn't because I was such a good girl. (laughs) But, you know, standing (laughs) there and having to hear that hundreds of times, you're like, can you just please say one different sentence to me? I just can't handle this anymore. And people don't understand. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I don't mean it in a condescending way. It's just that once you are on the other side, once you have lived through this, once you have experienced it, you see things very differently. And I just want to reach out to those who have experienced it to remember that all of us were in a situation once before where we had no idea what to say and had no idea how inappropriate it can feel to say something like that my condolences and it's a um, catch 22 and you kind of have to tell yourself yeah well that was that was really crappy that they said that but I'm glad Mm -hmm. they don't know what it's like to be me either yes yeah and that's not always easy to think in that situation no so (laughs) thank you so much for sharing this I really like the last those last couple of um golden nuggets of wisdom as well Thank you for being here, Rachel. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. And thank you uh, so much. To, thank you. Everybody who wants to connect with Rachel, you can do that throughout the group here. She's in our group, just so PM her or um, yeah, she'll be sharing links how to get in touch. So much love to all of you. This is Rachel and Marie signing off. Bye for now. Thank you. I have stopped the live stream. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really beautiful, really beautiful. I really wanted people to get to know you before we get into the book, and I really feel that we've, we've covered everything that I wanted. Uh, there are a lot of things in there that I had no idea about, so I really love what you shared. It's such a beautiful story. And yeah, as I said, you know, please feel free to share the links underneath the, the video. The, the quicker, the better. And um, I will upload this to YouTube and share the link with you as well in case you want to share that. And I would strongly recommend that when you have more than one link to share, which I think you would, um, to do one at a time. So you, okay. you're already doing it. So you have to... Um, I'm going to um, do one at a time now. <laughs> yeah, because I just, I just saw it pop up. Yeah, because when you do one at a time, then every every link gets a preview and it's just so much nicer if, you, if they get the preview. Okay. And, um, yeah okay cool i will let you go thank you so so much much. and um, i'll see you in the group (laughs) okay sounds good thank you take care bye for now see you bye